This episode is supported by MonsterJoysticks.com. Level up your Raspberry Pi with our all-in-one arcade kit using genuine Sanwa arcade parts. And OneClickPrint.com for your photos on canvas, acrylic, gifts and more. Local craftsmen and global delivery. Hello cave dwellers, welcome to the cave. It's the turn today of the PC Engine, a machine that never officially hit the shores of the UK, although that's all about to change thanks to the release of the upcoming PC Engine Mini. And it was inspired really by this month's edition of Retro Gamer magazine, which covers the PC Engine. I'm sure many of you are subscribed to that, but it just reminded me that I had this big old junky box full of PC Engine gear, most of it courtesy of Chrissy. Chrissy, thank you for sending this in a long, long time ago. It's about time that we got round to fixing this up. So let's see what we've got in the box uh, and get an idea of what we might be able to make out of all of these bits. Right, well, where do we start then? Clearly we've got the CD-ROM system over here uh, and immediately you can see taped to the top are some damaged cogs. So we're definitely gonna need to do something about that. It's good of Chrissy to put them on there because that helps us to troubleshoot this a little bit more quickly, hopefully. We've got two PC engines or at least the shells of two. Uh, that one's still in there. Now they didn't arrive like this. I did open them up to check for any obvious problems, leaking capacitors and such like. Um, so that's why they're open. And we've got the interface unit here, which the CD-ROM unit rather nicely sits in with the PC Engine next to it. So ideally my goal at the end of this is to have the PC Engine, the CD-ROM and everything working through this unit, but we'll see how far we get. We'll just start with the PC Engine today. Over in the box, we've got the innards of that second PC engine, which was empty. And it's made up of the system board, and we'll get more familiar with that throughout the uh, series, and the Hue card reader. And these should be connected together. But what I found was, as soon as I opened this up and moved the cable, they just tore away. The ribbon cable just tore away. Um, there is no sign of leaking capacitors there, which may have degraded the cable. I think it's just age. Um, this old cable's got stiff, um, it's got brittle, and as soon as I moved it, it tore away. In fact, there, are, there should be two cables. There'll be another one. There it is. Um, the more I moved it, the more came away, so I just took it off completely. Uh, and we'll clear those holes with, this, with the desoldering gun and replace the cable. Uh, it's still connected here. Let's just see how brittle it is. I'm just going to bend the cable here. I'll apply minimal pressure, and we'll just see if it does the same as it did to me at the other ends. Now, see, that seems okay there. But it is a warning to you, if you open up your PC Engine, uh, just be very careful of these cables, because in my case, all except for this bit came away really easily. And I wish I had that on camera, but I don't. So we'll carefully desolder that and replace the cable with some new cable. Uh, we've got the top of the CD-ROM unit there, or the interface unit, sorry. There's that cable. We've got one controller, and everything is a little bit yellowed here and there, so there is the potential to retrobrite the PC Engine, but that's always the last thing we need to think about. First of all, we need to make sure it's actually working. So we've got that. I have bought, in anticipation of doing this, um, a replacement uh, power supply. So make sure you've got the right power supply and the right polarity. If we're to use the CD-ROM unit, we need the uh, Hue card for it, which we have got here. Again, thank you, Chrissy. that's in there. So that's good to have. There's a couple more Hue cards in here. We've got, um, well, they're both they're both in Japanese. That one, I've got no clue what that is. I did buy Chase HQ a while back, but that's gone missing. So hopefully I can find that because that's a fun game. We've got various parts from where I've disassembled the other one. I have bought recapping kits in advance. So we may well go ahead and recap these units. I have got the dust cover for the expansion bus which is nice. It's nice to be able to fill that hole if we're not using the CD-ROM system. I imagine they get lost quite a lot. And this looks like some kind of controller converter. Not quite sure what that's for. All of these things we'll figure out before the end of the series. Don't worry, I will answer these questions. I'm just giving you my first impressions. And then there's some shielding, which has got stuck to a bit of tape with the switch and the various <laughs> screws, which I took out when I took it apart to make sure I didn't lose them. So that's what we're working with today. It really is a big old box of PC Engine trash. And uh, it's gonna be a journey of discovery today, I think, because I've not worked on the system before. I've got a few ideas on how we can perhaps improve it if we can get it working. So let's take it all over to the lab. Let's learn all about it. And at the end of it, let's hopefully have some PC Engine treasure to enjoy. 
here it is on the workbench then to take a look at. It's such a nice compact machine and way better looking in my opinion than the turbo graphics that officially appeared here in the UK and the US. I'd take the little white PC engine any day of the week. You can immediately see that it's a really compact board. We've got three Hudson branded ICs in the middle of the board. Two chips make up the GPU or graphics processing unit and they are the HU6270, that's a video display controller or VDC which has 64K of video RAM to work with. Then we've got the H2-6260 which is the video color encoder or VCE and they're complemented by the HU6280 which is the CPU. It's a derivative of the popular MOS Technology 6502 CPU, the same CPU that we found in the Commodore 64 but this one has some added bells and whistles which allows it to run at two speeds. It can run at 1.79 megahertz or a blister 7.16 megahertz. You put that in the context of the Commodore 64 and this thing absolutely flies. Baked into that chip is also a six channel sound generator. So all of your video processing and sound needs are covered with this cluster of chips. It's really neat. This is all complemented by 8K of working RAM down at the bottom of the board here, which isn't a great deal, but the games which came on Hue cards reached sizes of 20 megabits or 2.5 megabytes in size. So the machine was able to tie all of this together to great effect, and hopefully we'll get to see that later. So where do we start on fixing this? Well, power is always a good idea. So tucked down here is a good old 7805 voltage regulator, which is why we've got such a big heat sink in place. These get really toasty and the heat needs to be dissipated. The 7805's job is to take our 9 volt DC input and give us a 5 volt DC output. It's a simple task to measure this and make sure it's working with your multimeter. Leg 1 is the input, 2 is the ground, and 3 is the output. So you can measure this carefully, either on top of the board or underneath, whichever suits you better, to see if we're getting those readings or anything close to those readings. Just be careful not to short out the legs while you're measuring this. And I can quickly see that yes, we do have a power problem here. There's barely anything registering at all on the input and well, nothing on the output whatsoever. So how does this compare to our second working PC engine? Well, we'll need to open it up and this is done by removing the security screws. So if you haven't got a security screwdriver, it might be worth getting yourself one. These screws are used in a variety of consoles of Sega, Nintendo, PC Engine, all sorts of consoles. So it's worth having this in your toolkit. You can get the screws undone with a pair of pliers in a pinch, but you do risk damaging the case. So for a couple of quid, treat yourself. On checking the regulator in this one, we've got 8.2 volts on the input, close enough and five volts on the output. So this regulator is fine and that's exactly how we'd want it to behave. Back then to our broken console, I continued checking the voltage from the power input and then something a bit more obvious came to light when I took the heat sink off, which keeps the regulator cool. Hidden away under there is a one amp fuse and well, it looks a little milky on the outside. So let's zoom in and enhance that please. And yes, you can see our fuse has quite obviously blown. Of course we need to replace that fuse, but I'm going to also replace the voltage regulator with something that might help with the longevity of the system. What I'm going to replace this with is not another 7805, but instead it's this little package here. This is an Oki branded switching regulator. The part number is in the video description and it does exactly the same job as the 7805. It's a drop-in replacement, but it does it in a much more efficient manner. And the result of this is much, much less heat to the point where we don't even need the heat sink anymore and it will be far, far kinder to the surrounding electrolytic capacitors. They're no friend of heat and they can quickly dry out when they're so close to a heat source as the 7805. So this is a win-win however you look at it. So I quickly installed the switching voltage regulator and before I go to the shop to buy myself some fuses, I thought I'll just pinch the fuse out of the other PC engine, which was intact for testing. And I very lazily slapped it in quickly using the desoldering gun. Yes, sometimes I cut corners too. In all honesty, I found that my usual chisel tip on the iron was a little ineffective and I didn't want to wait for it to cool down to change the tip. So uh, please take this opportunity to roast me in the comments section. A little later, you'll see a larger tip on my soldering iron and that really did get the job done. So if we perform a test this time, we've got nine volts going in and we've got around five volts coming out of our new switching regulator, all without that big old chunky heat sink, lovely stuff. 
So now that I know we've got our five volts going into the board, let's swap that fuse out again. That, that belongs in the other PC engine. Because the luxury of not having the heatsink in place now is that we have the clearance to install a fuse hold. So that makes swapping the fuse out in future even easier. So I did that and then I popped in a one amp fuse and it wasn't quite flush with the PCB. The legs on the fuse holder get wider towards the top and annoyingly, it, there's just a tiny amount of wobble, but I'm, I'm confident that it's in there and it's not gonna cause any problems. It just needed a little bit of hot glue to give it a bed to sit on so that it doesn't wobble and then it's fine. I'm sure with a little bit of shopping around, you can find a more suitable fuse holder than I had in stock here. So I feel like we're on a roll now, so let's continue this. This isn't strictly necessary, but as the board is currently detached from the Hue card reader, I thought I'd just take the opportunity to recap it. It's far easier done with all of that ribbon cable out of the way. And as I said, the capacitors, especially that were near the 7805, will probably be thankful for being replaced. So let's swap out all of those electrolytic caps and give the board a clean under them as we go. With all of those capacitors replaced, it was then time to figure out what to do with the cable to the Hue card reader. Whatever we're going to do, I need to clear the holes of the bits of cable that were in there, where the cable ripped away. And this was mostly achieved by adding fresh solder to the holes and then using the desoldering gun to get it all molten, mixing it in with the debris and then sucking it out. The desoldering gun is great, but a job like this can quickly block it. And if you try to push on with the job when it's not working efficiently, well, you can quickly start damaging things. So uh, keep your desoldering gun clean, have some spare tips to hand and you'll be fine. For some of the more stubborn bits of debris that wouldn't come out with the gun, I, I gently heated them and then slid them out with tweezers. But you gotta be careful, make sure that the debris is moving freely before you actually pull them. Otherwise you can easily pull the eyelet out of the hole if you pull too hard. And then you've lost your connection to the trace and it all gets terribly messy. So we want to avoid that if we can, just make sure everything's moving, don't force anything. And then with all of the holes cleared, we can give it a really good clean up with some IPA. So how should we reconnect our Hue card reader? The space between each hole, or the pitch as it's known, is a standard 2.54 millimeters. So we could easily find something, but I quite like the idea of putting a header in so that we can detach the two halves of the PC engine if we want to. It might be a tight squeeze given how small the case is, but uh, let's give it a go and see what happens. You'll also notice that the two rows of holes are not completely in line, they're slightly offset. So it's not a case of just dropping in, say an IDE header. You need to have two rows of separate headers. And when I tried to put mine in, even though they're advertised as having a pitch of 2.54 millimeters, they must be Japanese millimeters or something because they don't quite fit. It's just a tiny bit out to the point where if you put an entire row in, it kind of bends in the middle and that's not good. We don't want that stress constantly being on a connector. So I split the header into smaller chunks and just shaved a little bit off the edge to bring it back into line. There we go, that makes sure all of the pins are even and none of them are sitting too proudly. With those soldered into place and everything cleaned up, everything is ready there. We're recapped, we've got that nice voltage regulator in there, we've got a new fuse, we've got our header pins. We just need to connect the Hue card reader. Now, as lovely as it would be to have header pins at this end so we can detach the cable at either end, there just isn't the room for it in the PC Engine's case. This is a really tight squeeze where the Hue card reader goes in, so I have to solder the cable directly into the PCB. Trying to get the plastic sheath of the cables nice and flush to the board so that we avoid any stray or fray cables 
shorting out uh, the, the hole next to it. We want to keep everything really, really neat. So take your time over this. And it's tricky because tinning the wires before putting them through these little holes can actually make them too big to push through. Uh, so I opted to twist them, solder them when they're through the hole, trim them, and just work out a system that keeps them as neat as possible. The cables I'm using are DuPont jumper cables, and they're readily available in lots of shops. And they're the sort that you might use for an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi project. And I've chosen them because I really wasn't in the mood for crimping over 40 cable ends. DuPont wires are already terminated and then you just slide them into a plastic block like so. I don't think you can get a block that's 11 wires wide, which is what you need for each row. So I've done the best I can by splitting them up. And I kind of like the rainbow of colors. It feels a bit more fitting for the PC engine than the original dull gray cable. Now with that done, I can't possibly put it all back in a dirty case. So I took the chance to give everything a really good scrub for both of the PC engines, in fact. A brush is essential for this job to get all those vents, nooks and crannies cleaned. And yes, baking powder for fluffy muffins came out just to give it enough uh, of an abrasive edge to work on and get those really stubborn scuffs and marks off of the plastics. That incidentally is the original tub of baking powder that I had when I started the channel uh, in 2016. It's, it's way out of date. You don't want to be making any muffins with that, but it's still perfect for cleaning. And then we can put everything back in the case. Now this is a bit fiddly with what I've done because the drawback of the cable we've got compared to a flat cable is that it will bunch up. It won't instantly lay flat. So uh, it takes a bit of poking around to get everything to line up, but hopefully in time, it will form a bit of a memory of where it will lay and it will be easier if you need to open and close it. There's, doesn't feel like there's any stress on the case when I screw it together. There's no bulges as if everything's pushing onto the header pins or anything like that. It's a close fit, but it is a fit. So we've got away with this and I'm really happy with that result. So now we can test it. Does our PC engine live? Let's find out. Does it work indeed? And before I press that on button, I must apologize if you've spotted any continuity issues. The lights in the cave here were condemned a couple of weeks ago and it's taken well, two and a half weeks for the landlord to actually get it sorted. So I've been filming sporadically with temporary lights, just trying to do what I can to get this episode together. Uh, and I'm glad that we've got to this point. But if you need any explanation as to the multiple wardrobe changes throughout, that's why. Anyway, let's see if this PC engine works. We'll flick it on now. You know, it'd really help if I plugged it in at the television. <laughs> you saw nothing. That didn't happen. Okay, does this PC engine work? Let's turn it on and find out. Apparently not. Hi. Right. <laughs> not another cable. <laughs> it works if you plug the power in and if you plug it into the television. But <laughs> it works. It actually works. This is brilliant. Let's just turn the volume up and make sure we've got some audio here. And we've got audio. Now, a symptom that you often get with these is just a plain white screen, which means it can't actually read the hue card. It's not a big problem if you've got a white screen, as I found with the second PC engine that we had in the box. Here's a clip of me testing it. We saw earlier that the voltage regulator in it was fine and all I got was the white screen when I turned it on. So I gave the hue card a clean with some IPA and then I put that in and out of the hue card slot multiple times to clean up the contacts in the hue card slot and then it worked perfectly. So that PC engine wasn't broken, it just had dirty contacts. So that's why we haven't really seen much of that second PC engine in the episode. It's been all about this one and uh, it's working great. Now, where do we go from here? Obviously, we've got the CD-ROM. This is actually called, it's, it's got CD-ROM and then a little two there as if it's CD-ROM squared. You actually pronounce this CD-ROM-ROM, ROM, so, <laughs> which I love. So uh, uh, we've got the CD-ROM-ROM ROM to try and get working because I've got a distinct lack of game. So if we can get this working and get a load of uh, 
copied games downloaded and burned, and that really opens up the library for me. You saw as I was testing the second PC Engine there that the interface unit works just fine, but it does present us with a little bit of a problem. The PC Engine itself only has a TV modulator as a, a video output, and yes, you can RGB mod it, but if we're going to use the interface unit so that we can use the CD-ROM, ROM, this only has a composite out. So I'm wondering if we can maybe modify the interface unit so that we can get RGB out to get the best possible picture. But what I've been using in the meantime is this cable which I managed to pick up on eBay because the expansion slot on the back gives you every possible output that you could possibly want from the PC Engine, including the RGB outputs. So somebody on eBay has made a cable, I'll put a link in the description, which wires in and then it goes straight through to a SCART cable at the other end and gives us our RGB output to give us a really nice output without having to actually modify the console at all. So that's really nice, but I can't plug that into the interface unit. So as a standalone PC engine with this cable, brilliant, but we've got lots more work to do. I'm certainly not gonna be using the RF modulator, that's for sure. Anyway, I'm really pleased with how things look today. Uh, the PC engines came up really white as well. I, I don't think we actually need to retro bright it if I'm honest with you guys. And that's good at this time of year in the UK. There's barely any sun out there to help us. Um, I have had some problems with the controller. If the wire gets bent, it stops working. So we'll need to take that apart and have a look at that. And of course the CD-ROM drive. So that's what we'll do in episode two. In the meantime, thank you for watching. I'd love to hear your recommendations on games that I should try, especially if they have an English language option because I haven't got a clue what I'm doing on a lot of these games. So uh, I'd appreciate your suggestions and as always, Thank you for watching and take care everyone. If you enjoy my content and would like to support The Cave while receiving a completely ad-free experience and access to releases one week before they go public, then visit patreon.com forward slash retro man cave and join the official cave dwellers. Thank you for your support.